Krishna is, is our interface to Congressman Tim Ryan, but of course an, a force of nature in his own right. And I, uh, without much further ado, I'm actually going to get you to, to talk about what you do and how you're going to interface with Tim Ryan yourself, because I think there's a bit of a twist to the, to the tale that you're about to tell us. Krishna, thank you so much. Thank you. And I'm, I'm, I'm being very, very quick at introducing you. I'm noticing you. Because people need to go home, right? Yeah. <laughs> so going last has its advantages and disadvantages. I heard everybody else. I got the good joke so that I can repeat them. So to start with, I think Jeremy said this in the morning once, but it's weird Asian stuff. You know, he can get away with it because his name is Jeremy Hunter. With a name like Krishna, I can get away with it. <laughs> you know, it's very difficult. And what am I doing with Congressman Tim Ryan? Because it all started with us merging our dreams. My dream was to build an enlightened society where inner awareness empowers people to thrive in harmony. And his is about building a mindful nation. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. So when I saw that, I said, that's what he's trying to do. So why don't we just align, work together? So I reached out to him, and we've been working together uh, almost two years. Oh, a little over two years now. Yeah, July 2012. So. And we don't necessarily always see things the same way. And that has its own benefits. And he's a very broad-minded, open-minded person who tends to listen to a lot of input. And he's the fastest person to integrate it in his next talk. He's unbelievable. So you're going to miss him today in a live format because you'll miss some of his awesome stories. But there is a bright side to everything. You get to go home on time. <laughs> So today, one of the things I was talking about is mindfulness versus mindful living. And Marion talked about it as well, because personally, I don't like to get into arguments about definitions and so on, but nobody will debate, do you want to have a good mindful life? So how you get there, there are different ways to get there, and I let people choose how to get there, but mindfulness is one great approach to get there, and as we talk about the different areas, you'll start to see. So when we talked about a mindful nation, we spent a lot of time about what the, how do we bring this together. So even in the design of the logo, you can see it comes from various directions, various colors, and the coming together creates the space, and this was designed for the United States, so there's a star, and everything has meaning, so the five points of the star have certain meaning that I will get to in a second. So obviously, since I'm last, I can skip this slide because you already know this by now. If you haven't, then you haven't been here, <laughs> present. So for all the good reasons on the slide here, attention is something we heard from the morning. Uh, Yuta was so clear about one, two, and three attention, intention, and attitude. So these are, and it's a cycle. So as you stray away from it, you just start over. So what I'm going to talk about is the why. And some of you might have heard this uh, acronym, we live in a VUCA world. So, and we live in a muddled state. We're so distracted most of the time, and we keep buying more gadgets that will do more to us, right? In the guise of being more productive. That's, that's the irony there, because we think we're getting more productive. And uh, somebody talked about a resume that says, I'm a great multitasker. That reaches the trash can when I interview, because there's nobody who's a great multitasker. In fact, they don't do anything right. OK? So living in a muddled state, and life is not getting any simpler. We are on a constant basis adding more and more onto our lives, which means it'll get more complicated as time goes by. So how do we build tools and resources to rejuvenate ourselves, some kind of renewal? And when I talk about teachers later, I'll talk about that. So for me, how I got into this is at, I started or thrown into this at 16 because of a troubled adolescent time. And literally three failed suicide attempts. And then finally you get the realization, 
if I can't kill myself, maybe I should spend more time learning how to live. <laughs> I mean, it, it was that stark. I can laugh about it now, it wasn't fun over then. So, and that's really how I got into it, and I happened to live half a kilometer from Mahesh Yogi's TM place. So my dad sent me there, and I have to tell you this, so we go through the initiation, and the gentleman asks, how many of you fell sleepy? About half the row. How many of you actually went to sleep? Just me. <laughs> so he says, maybe you should get more rest. And that's, I think, is a key piece. Nutrition, rest, and all these things come together. So it's not a one panacea that we are talking about, which is mindfulness. So living a mindful life has multiple components. So now I come to confessions. Post-16, I became an engineer. Then I did my master's in television and film. So I'm still going both ways. So I call myself a recovering engineer. <laughs> but beyond that, my father was an electronics engineer, and he made it our home 100% on logic. If it, is, if it can be explained through logic, it doesn't exist. So now I'm a recovering logic bigot as well. So now that that's out of the way, I would like to uh, walk you through. And the way we interacted in this presentation is I talked to Juliet and uh, Yuta, and I asked questions of Congressman Ryan, and he's going to answer them for us. So the first one is about, I just shared how I got into this, and he's going to share how he got into it, if it works. Well, I trace uh, kind of adopting mindfulness uh, in my life uh, all the way back to growing up Catholic and having uh, a good many people in my life uh, uh, my mother, my grandparents, uh, who were um, taking time, I think, to uh, pray the rosary and have some, have some quiet time. And I remember going down to my grandparents' house at times during the summer, and they lived just a few blocks away from us. Uh, and they would have the TV off and the radio off, and they would be spending time uh, praying the rosary. Uh, and that was their contemplation. That was their version of, of mindfulness and prayer at that point. And I went to Catholic school for 12 years, and I remember my football coaches, uh, American football, um, where they would sneak into a, a chapel in the school building and take time during the school day. You know, old football coaches from Northeast Ohio um, would find time for quiet. And, and I think that's why it was easy for me. Um, as I went throughout my life and things got more hectic as I got into politics and got busier and busier, what really, looking back now, 41 years old, have been doing this now for you know uh, six years or so, um, I've written a book about it and, and all the rest, I think really what made it easy is that my reference points in my childhood were of people that that took time for quiet. And that, to me, really ultimately, I think, gave me the strength and the ability to say, hey, I think this is an important uh, part of my life, and I'm not going to hide or run from it. And, uh, I'm going to share it and, uh, and hopefully you know, uh, help other people find out really how, uh, how it can benefit them as well. Yes, to have him link in. So he was supposed to participate live, and then he was on a flight at this time coming back from Denver, so he couldn't be Skyping from a plane. So we did this, and it got downloaded this morning. So I was multitasking, guilty as uh, charged in the back, downloading this this morning. So you're just seeing it. I, haven't, I barely got to listen to all of them. So if we are not perfectly in sync, that's OK, because it's our perspectives. So how I added this after listening to some of the speakers this morning, because decisions and choices are really the actions that we can take by being more mindful. So I make a nuance between decisions and choices in the following way. Usually decisions, according to the way I look at the world, it takes a little, you give, you have time. But you have many choices that you make 
on a minute by minute basis where you don't process, you just do it. Do I have the next drink? Do I eat that next steak? All these things, you're not doing a decision tree that is taught in MBA school because there you can, you have the time and the, you can afford to look at pros and cons, consequences over time, so on and so forth. But there are so many, I call it minute choices or minute choices, it's the same spelling, that we keep doing. And depending on which researcher you ask, it's anywhere, it's in the thousands on a daily basis. So imagine the power that you give away by ignoring to make that choice. So if you're not mindful, you're actually giving up that power to make that choice on a daily basis, moment by moment basis. And by the way, doing nothing is a choice. You're making a choice whether knowingly or unknowingly not to do something. So that's really what I'm talking about. And if you ask people, you'll find the most common answer is logic. But I beg to differ, and most of the time I find that at least for myself and men, all the people I work with, we're driven by fear. If you really think about it, go and look at your own parenting style. Be careful is one of the most favorite words a parent uses with their child. And it may be as simple as teaching them how to cross the road. But the first thing we tell them is be careful. So somebody in the audience tell me what action can somebody take when they're told, be careful. Anybody? No, there is an action you can take. It's called inaction. You, you freeze. So that's really what we kind of train our children by being careful instead of saying, look both sides when there's nothing coming, cross the road. Very different set of instructions than be careful. And we keep pounding this be careful into our children. So that's a very benign way of instilling fear. And I'll go, I won't go into all the other more uh, overt ways of instilling fear. Then comes greed. And this is, these are all basic uh, pieces of our human condition. And the last one is our pride. So here we have all these forces that come in in addition to logic. So it's not that logic doesn't exist. But it's almost like, think of it that if you have four people rowing in your boat, and three, you can't see what the other three are doing. And you happen to keep, want, need to keep the boat in a straight line. How difficult is it going to be if you don't look at what the other three are doing? Right? It's going to be pretty difficult. So logic is included. The four beautiful circles that we saw this morning about evidence and judgment and learning about from your own mistakes, so on and so forth. All that plus these three. So add some more. I was surprised I didn't see this this morning, but uh, throughout today, but I'm sure many of you have seen this, right? Some people challenge me, how do you know what the dog saw? I didn't make this picture, it's a cool picture, <laughs> okay? So that's what I believe. So from a, we just talked about it from a personal benefit. Now, how do you see the broader benefits of living a mindful life? So part of the way I segmented life of each individual is we live in six life spaces. So yourself, your partner, your friends, your work, your money, and your kids. So in each of these spaces, we make choices. And being mindful in one, and one of the things I do in my workshop is I ask people to rate themselves how well they do on a zero to 10 scale in each of these spaces. And then I ask them to prioritize one through six. And many, many times they have some very interesting realizations that areas that they're doing really well is low priority and the areas that are high priority, they're not doing so well. So all this is about raising your own awareness. So I talked to uh, Tim about how he uses it at work in politics. Well, how do you apply mindfulness uh, to politics uh, is, is really tough. I, I think it's, it's not really any different than anybody who's trying to be clear and aware of what's going on around them in a highly stressed environment. And I'm not the only one. I mean, you can be a, a single mom with a, a two or three kids and, or in a tough economic situation where uh, you're trying to be clear-headed and to be aware uh, in your work. And I think uh, 
you know, the key for me is to try to do it every day so that when I'm in the field of action, when I'm practicing politics, when I'm trying to be a leader and making difficult decisions that, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, I, I have a little more clarity because I spent time earlier in the day just in quiet. And that's really what what's help, helps me um, in the moments of heated debate where you can try to calm yourself down, uh, listen, I think is, is the, probably the most important way to apply this, is to pay attention to what other people are saying, even though you may not have agreed with them on much in the past. You never know when there's an opportunity to build a coalition or to find points of agreement. Um, so trying to be a listener, aware, clear, resilient, uh, I think is something that I try to apply in my work. But the reason I want to push mindfulness out into our schools, into our healthcare system is, is uh, so that those folks who work in those fields, teachers, um, people in the healthcare profession who have very high levels of uh, exhaustion and burnout in the social work area, same thing, high levels of exhaustion and burnout, so that they can find a, a tool that can help them deal with the stress in their lives and help them apply it to their own work every day as well. So the Mindful Nation really was his idea and the book is the same name. And, I'm, and the question here was, what do we see as his vision for a mindful nation? Well, my vision for the United States as a mindful nation uh, is that we can take uh, some steps uh, by, I think, re-energizing our institutions uh, here in the United States. So whether it's our military, our veterans uh, administration <laughs> that deals with uh, all of the veterans who are coming back from war, or who have come back from war, we have about 22 suicides a day uh, with veterans in the United States, which is unconscionable in my estimation. We need to re-energize and get a new approach to uh, healing our veterans. Uh, and Krishna is doing a lot of work uh, on that front uh, with helping with veterans. Um, and, and so we need to move down, down that road as well. Um, but how do we re-energize these in institutions? And I think for a couple of reasons. One, I think if we do it properly, if we become a little more clear, a little more focused on what the issues are uh, that are holding us back and spend a little bit of time understanding those, whether it's the money that's involved in politics or other things, but then focusing on what our strengths are and what the future is and how we can focus on those things to enhance those and to grow those. And so my vision for a mindful nation in the United States is how we can kind of get ourselves uh, detached from the current negativity that's happening in our country, the kind of the fear-based thinking that we have, there's a lot of anger, how we can kind of get ourselves out of that mindset and start focusing on really what what we can improve on and what our strengths are and how do we grow that and then give people an opportunity to share in that, in that uh, growing economy and growing uh, kind of uh, quality of life and well-being that we would have in the United States if, if we were a little bit more mindful and our institutions were a little bit more re-energized by being clear on, on what the real missions of those institutions are. So the five areas that we have focused on, as uh, Tim mentioned, were children, are, I mean, veterans are the most urgent community in need, and children are the most <coughs> important. And the way we plan to reach children is through teachers, and really, and teachers, it's not about teaching them how to teach mindfulness, it's more about self-care, because burnout in teachers is very high in the US, and then we talked about leaders uh, creating the workspaces that create the stress, and lastly, the wellness professionals, because the caregivers have a high degree of burnout as well. So the challenge is really right now is some number of people get it, but the majority, the mass adoption, the mainstream, in order to get them to buy into it, it needs a different strategy. The people, the ambassadors that need to take it to 
the mainstream, have to be like them. They need to be trusted by the people. It can be the people who are the pioneers because the mainstream, the pragmatist, does not listen to pioneers because they want to listen to prag other pragmatists. And I want to share what uh, Tim has to say about some of these challenges. Well, I think you need third-party validators. I mean, to me, that really is what's essential. And our culture today, which is very similar to yours in so many different ways, um, where a lot of people are known for what they do on TV. A lot of it's through sports. There's a lot of respect for the military in the United States. It's one of the last institutions that, that has a lot of uh, res general respect across the populace. Uh, how do we put those folks who are involved in mindfulness, uh, are studying mindfulness, have evidence uh, of this having benefits for the Marines, for example, or for veterans, how do those people become the face? Um, Phil Jackson, who's a great basketball coach here in the United States uh, with both the Chicago Bulls and the Los Angeles Lakers, uh, was, is the winningest uh, coach, has like 11 titles uh, in his uh, career in basketball. He's a mainstream person who promotes this. And so how do we have him become the face? How do we have the Marines become the face? How do we have guys like Keith Mitchell, who's an, an all-pro uh, uh, football player from the National Football League, who's a big uh, yoga practitioner and mindfulness practitioner now? How do those people really become the face of uh, the movement? And I think that would be my advice, is how do you pull in people from different areas of the culture to really become the face? Ultimately, that's kind of, I think, where we're having success here in the United States is by letting those people kind of take the lead on that. So our whole vision was actually how to share compelling stories of success. And I use a simple uh, analogy. If somebody loses 200 pounds, you don't need to tell anybody. You just need to walk around. And those who are interested will ask how you did it. So that's a simple strategy of actually modeling some of the benefits and people who knew you before will ask you one of two questions. What drugs are you on or what else did you do? So I want to put in context what are the pieces that need to come together to make something happen. So for example, for the Veterans Project, we, we worked on it for more than a year and these were the pieces that I felt came together. So we need charismatic leaders and he called them uh, third-party validators, and then we need solution providers who have the main means how to fix these issues. But those two are not enough. We still need visionary donors, or in fact, it could be even public funds, and Tim is going to touch on that, plus these missionary ambassadors. And ambassadors, we spent probably six months defining who an ambassador is. These are not people who are well-known. They're just regular, ordinary people who have had some trans personal transformation and have seen the benefits so strongly that they will uh, actually be great voices for this to be shared with their friends. Well, I think building a mindful nation and spreading mindfulness uh, kind of go hand in hand. The spreading of mindfulness, at least as I'm thinking about it now, is about raising awareness, uh, having politicians and uh, football uh, stars and, and uh, championship basketball teams and coaches, um, people in our military like the United States Marines saying, hey, this is something that we uh, do that it benefits us in so many different ways and the rest of the country should at least look at these groups or people that they identify with whether it's the military or athletics or CEOs and say hey maybe this isn't so new agey maybe this is something real that we really need to um, look at and focus on so spreading the word the word and the awareness I think is very very important building a mindful nation I think is about okay, how do we take public money and continue to research uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction as one example, but other things and other alternative approaches uh, to help our veterans, for example, um, that, that can have great benefits and help heal some of the trauma that our veterans are suffering. 
How do we study these alternative approaches with uh, public money? How do we, and I'm not necessarily saying new public money, I'm saying how do we spend maybe what we currently have in a better direction that's going to yield more results. Um, in education, for example, building a mindful nation is about how we get uh, teachers in colleges of education all across the United States to begin teaching mindfulness-based stress reduction, skills in social and emotional learning so that teachers can then pass these, embody these uh, benefits and embody the practice and then pass that along to the students, to the young children, both the social and emotional learning and the awareness and attention practices that come through mindfulness. And how do we gear uh, school districts, colleges of education and school districts also to have that through continuing education in which teachers have to get every so often, maybe have uh, social and emotional learning and these kind of practices qualify for um, continuing education. In, in healthcare, for example, teaching doctors in our, um, in our medical schools about mindfulness-based stress reduction, first and foremost for themselves, it's a very highly uh, stressed profession to begin with, um, but also uh, teaching them how to teach their patients. That's building it. Those are examples of building it into the current institutions as opposed to just, hey, we're going to talk about it and talk about how great it is. Um, we're just spreading the word, but building it into these institutions, doing innovative things within these institutions that are going to change the trajectory of our country. You know, I mean, you just imagine uh, students who are getting it in schools, doctors who are getting it, healthcare workforce, educators, parents who are involved in the school but also may go to their doctor with some anxiety and instead of getting medication, they may try this practice. You can see how it can get woven together. Add in veterans. For our Marines, for example, the average uh, Marine stays, uh, I think, uh, five or six years in the Marine Corps, and then they go back to the community that they came from. Imagine if all of our Marines uh, would learn this practice, and then after they get all the skills of leadership and development and resiliency and all the things that they would learn through the traditional Marine program, also having a mindfulness component, and then going back to be a teacher, a nurse, a doctor, a firefighter, a police officer, and already embodying those skills. That's how you build kind of the nuts and bolts, the bricks and mortar of a, of a mindful nation. Round this out, this is a paid forward program. So it's an ambassador-led paid forward community that having seen the benefit, they model it, not sell it. So somebody can actually see the benefits and then adopt it if they choose to. And I'm going to, one of the questions that I was asked, this is really short, is when can you visit Tim's district? Well, you, uh, you're welcome to come uh, whenever you'd like to Ohio and, and visit uh, our district. Uh, we're, we're trying our best to really, uh, you know, improve and increase what's happening uh, in a mindful way, and we have a, a couple of school districts that are really pursuing this, and we would love for you to come to uh, Warren City Schools in Northeast Ohio and, and see what we're doing. Uh, we're very excited about that, and there are other programs that are happening. Kent State University, uh, which is in my congressional district, just got, uh, was part of a three and a half million dollar award to study mindfulness-based stress reduction and how it helps with high blood pressure. Uh, partnered with the University of Pennsylvania. So that's happening in our district as well. We've got a lot of work to do, um, but we're excited about what's happening in Youngstown, Ohio, and in the region, uh, what we're doing economically to bring the area back. We've come a long, long way. Um, but I think part of the approach um, to what we're doing back home has been, it has been a mindful approach in the sense that Democrats and Republicans are working together in my congressional district. Um, business and labor, we're working together in my congressional district. We're working very closely with our university partners, whether it's Youngstown State University, Akron University, or Kent State University. We're all working together, and we've seen success because we sit down and we listen to each other. We find the areas where we can collaborate and we can bring in investment, and it's worked out. And just in the last few years, we've seen a billion dollar steel mill locate in Youngstown, Ohio. Uh, just a, a few days ago, we've seen 
Uh, our uh, business software incubator uh, was just ranked the number one business incubator that's affiliated with the university in the world. The number one incubator out of 800 uh, happening there. And that was, again, a collaboration, uh, public, private, Democrats, Republicans, business, labor, all supporting this kind of thing. Uh, and that's what's happening in our area. And we also have uh, President Obama's first additive manufacturing institute, which is in downtown Youngstown, the first of many that he's going to create uh, here in the United States, cutting edge manufacturing happening in Youngstown, Ohio. Those are the kind of things that happen, I think, when you sit down, you collaborate, you listen, you are aware of where people are coming from, you pay attention, you stay focused, you are resilient as you build through um, some of the ups and downs of trying to uh, revive an older econo uh, economic region and bring some life back. And it's been fun, but I would say that I think a lot of these mindful practices, whether everyone knows that's what we're doing or not, uh, have been very, very helpful. So you're welcome to come anytime. So Jutta talked about a revolution. He calls it a quiet revolution. Mm -hmm. So that's what it is. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, okay. I have given you such a question. Oh.